wonderful good music, good singing this evening. We appreciate that so much. Please take your Bible and turn to the book of Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. saved, and that's by the calling. God the Father calls, God the Son died paying for our sins. God the Holy Spirit convicts, converts. After that we get saved, born again, child of God, we are commanded to grow, and uh, it should be the natural thing to want to grow, grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then follow Him. You see it in the life of the apostles as Jesus called out those fishermen, uh, they got saved, and then later he had called them uh, to be fishers of men and called them to uh, follow him, and they did follow him. They were uh, you know, people like us, but they got saved, and then they, they followed Christ, most of them leaving all. And uh, in our Christian history and heritage, there is... Uh, these countless stories of people who have given all, left all, and done all to follow Christ, and so forth. And one of the greatest examples, of course, in the Bible is the Apostle Paul. And in Romans chapter 15, he is speaking about his preaching ministry. After that, he got saved on the road to Damascus. He, he saw Christ on the road to Damascus. He got saved, and immediately he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be shown thee what thou shalt do. And then God used another man and sent him down to Straight Street, lay his hands on him, receive his sight, and so forth. Within that, there is the uh, transitional period of the church. We're kind of talking about some of those things on Wednesday night. But uh, Paul didn't let up. After that, he got saved. He got uh, saved, he got baptized, and he got going. He got serving the Lord. And in Romans chapter 15, I'll break into the portion of the story to not give the, the whole context. I believe most of that you understand it, but I'm going in a specific direction. And he's talking about his preaching ministry, and I'll just pick up in verse 19. Of Romans chapter 15. Let's look at verse 18 for context. The Bible says, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. He was the apostle to the Gentiles, and you understand that. And he's talking about what God used him for or worked in him through him to get the Gentiles to believe and then be obedient to Christ. Verse 19, Through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Lycrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. That's in the prophets. And they that have not heard shall understand. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. Verse 22. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the day that you've given to us, and the day of life, the opportunity to serve you, the promises contained in the Word of God, its inspiration, preservation. And dear Lord, we thank you for the servants of God that have come out this evening. I pray, sweet Holy Spirit of God, you will forgive me of my sins, fill me with your spirit. Please allow me to be able to preach and teach the Word of God with truth, without heresy. And as your Word goes forth, that it would land on the fertile ground and produce fruit. 
Help us, dear Lord, to receive what you have for us. Give honor and glory to yourself. You alone are worthy. Asking for a blessing upon this church and churches that are preaching the gospel for the prayers of the saints, for the prayer list. And thank you, dear Lord, for the soul that was saved today. Please strengthen Jim. Please be with those with upcoming surgeries and meet their needs. But please, dear Lord, speak to us tonight to help us for this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In this portion of scripture, Paul is telling you and I that he has strove, he strived, he has strove, it's been striving, it's work to preach the gospel. He's been working at it and with much difficulty. Not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. He's getting the gospel to the unknown parts. He says he has fully preached the gospel of Christ. He pulls from the Old Testament in verse 21, that as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. See, the, the Jews, uh, they uh, didn't want Jesus. And... Uh, so they turned their back on Jesus. And so God has set them aside until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Not that a Jew can't get saved. You get saved the same way as you and I get saved. By grace through faith. And uh, they that have not heard shall understand. Talking about the Gentiles. And he's speaking about that he has been striving to preach the gospel to the Gentile world. And starting churches and so forth but trying to reach souls for the cause of Christ and the glory of God. And verse 22 is the direction I'm going. He says, for which cause? What cause is he talking about? The fact that he was in the ministry striving to preach the gospel. After that he got saved, he wanted other people to have a chance to be saved, the opportunity to be saved, and to preach the gospel, to witness to them so that they could be saved. And, of course, he did that. But for that cause of preaching the gospel, also I have been much hindered from coming to you. And I want to, to speak on that, of hindrances to a child of God. I'm, I'm talking about for basic Christian living. After that, you get saved. I'm talking about for doing what God would have you to do after you get saved. And, yes, a, a, a big portion of that or part of that is being a witness uh, to everyone and uh, all these things that you and I are supposed to do want to do for the cause of Christ and the glory of God are not without hindrances and there are hindrances the, the hindrances are instigated primarily uh, by Satan that's the main source. And you're not necessarily patted on the back for going around preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, the devil's crowd is not for that because the devil's not for it. And, and holding my spot here for just a moment, you understand in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I, I am talking about witnessing, that the portion of Scripture is talking about witnessing, but I'm talking about living for God, living for Christ. Uh, after that you get saved, the basics in Bible study, the basics in living for Christ, and the hindrances to doing that, hindrances in your walk with God. And it, it deals with the witness. It, it hinges around the witness. The devil didn't want you to get saved. And he fights it. There's an unseen spiritual battle. Spiritual, it's wickedness in, in high places. Once you get saved, the devil certainly doesn't want you living for God. Or making any advancement for God. It's like if he understands that you got saved and he knows about eternal security, Job, put a hedge of protection about him, that after you got saved, he can't get your soul but he can sure slow down or stop your victorious Christian living for God. And part of that, a big part of that, is your witness. You notice this about yourself. 
And uh, when you are down in the mully grubs, I, I mean, you're, you're low. You, you find yourself not speaking up as much for Jesus than when you're on top side. And if the devil can get you there, then it does affect, and I'm not talking to everybody, it's kind of a general statement, but it affects your witness, your testimony for the cause of Christ and the glory of God because the devil doesn't want anybody else to get saved. And God uses you as a human instrument to get to somebody else so that they get saved. And so he has hindrances. It's very clear in 1 Thessalonians 2, 18. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 18, the Bible says, and this is the Apostle Paul speaking, Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Satan hindered us. Uh, he's calling him out, him out by name. And so Paul calls him out by name. And so you and I can call it out by name. The instigator of all of it is Satan is hindering us from doing what we ought to do, from uh, having an influence on others to trying to reach others and so forth. But there's also some strong influences on the inside and from the outside. The, the main instigator is Satan, of course. But uh, very quickly, here are five great hindrances in your life, in my life, that come between you and the Savior come between you from following the Savior, and they can be a distraction to you, they can be a detour to you, and for some they can utterly destroy their Christian walk, these uh, hindrances. One or more of these typically become a hindrance in the life of every child of God. More than one in some. And uh, you can see it. I, I, I could see this in vacation Bible school amongst the kids. Sadly, I, I could see it in my life, in, in, in others' life. It's the old sin nature versus the new nature that we have. You're a two-natured person. They're at war with one and another and so forth. And so these are prevalent in every even child of God's life, these five great hindrances. Number one, in, and very quickly, is a lack of faith. That, that God can, I know God can, but will He? I know God can. He's all powerful, He's omniscient, He's everywhere at all times and everything. I know He can, but will He? And one of the hindrances in a child of God's life is a lack of faith. Matthew 6.30, of course, Sermon on the Mount type material in Matthew 6.30. The Bible says in Matthew 6.30, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? A lack of faith is a hindrance with the child of God. Matthew 8, 26 puts it this way. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose, rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Matthew 16, verse 8 says this, Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? In each of those cases, the individual is lacking faith in the area of some kind of a physical need. Can God provide my basic necessities if I fully and wholly follow Him like a Caleb, like a Joshua? who fully followed the Lord. Can he? He can. And then the individual gets into a mental gymnastics of will he? He will 
Faith pleases God. And the lack of faith displeases God. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. One of the hindrances for a child of God in walking with God, in witnessing for God, is a lack of faith. God wants to save them more than you want them saved. God died for them in the lovely Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he rose again. He paid His blood. You and I are simply the messenger. We pray, and, uh, and God gives the increase. A, a lack of faith will hurt a child of God in His walk, in His witness. Number two, from Matthew chapter 19. These are hindrances to your walk with God. Hindrances in your, your witness for God. In Matthew chapter 19, and in verse 20, again cutting into the dialogue, the Bible says the young man, this is the account of the rich young ruler, Matthew 19, 20, the young man saith unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? In other words, he was a, a fine young gentleman. He, you, you want him for the neighbor, or for son-in-law. You, you want him. He's a good guy. You vote for him. All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor. Now shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But there was a hindrance in the young man, rich young ruler, from following Jesus. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. In the first account, there's a lack of faith that God can provide me the basic possessions. In this account, the young man had all those possessions. It wasn't that, can God provide me those things that I want in life? This young man had it all. The position and the power and all of the, the property or possessions. He had it all. His hindrance was a love for that financial gain. A love for that financial gain. In, in the first instance, there's a lack of faith. Can God provide for me if I follow Him? Yes, He can, He says. I clothe the, the grass of the field. And I can take care of your needs as well. And this individual, he was blessed to the point that his love of financial gain, it became a love of money. We all, I understand, have to work. It's honorable to work. A man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. But I'm talking about an over-affection of money and wealth that keeps you or keeps an individual from fully following Christ. Is it Christ or these things? Christ or these things? God can bless you with some things used for Him. God can trust some people with some things used for Him and others that He can't. A love of financial gain can be a hindrance, and it was for this individual. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 21, here's the third one very quickly. Matthew chapter 8, verse 21. This is something that you would primarily see in a young life, a vacation Bible school student, a young a Christian, typically it starts going away at an older age of an older Christian, but not always. And it is a life that is uh, me first or selfish. It's always about me, 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 me first. In Matthew chapter 8 and in verse uh, 20, well, look at 19 for context. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. 
Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. That means you need to count the cost. Verse 21, And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. This is a case of wrong priority. And it is within the life of a whole lot of Christians. They've got their priorities out of whack, out of balance. They've always got something that has to be done first. And the devil always allows something to be first. It's my life first. Suffer me first. It has been said, and you know the old adage, that if you need something done, ask the person that's the busiest. And somehow they fit it in. I don't know how. But there, there's also those that have always got something else to do first. When, when all these things get lined up, then I'll be able to serve. The devil's not going to allow things to get lined up. So you're going to turn around and it's over. Or when I get around to it. Matthew 6.33 is taught by Jesus and has to be learned by the Christian. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. You and I, everyone, have to put that into perspective. Is my life about me first my priorities, my plans, my prerogative, or is it about Jesus first? And he can help us with that. Jesus is to be first. Number four, these are hindrances. To getting the gospel out, these are hindrances to our walk with God. Uh, one or more can be prevalent in our lives and they, they can change. The instigator is Satan. Paul said, much hindrance. Then he named him. He said, Satan hindered me. He was aware of that. He was cognitive of that. And he's still doing that. Here's number four. A loyalty to friends and family that is greater than a loyalty to God. A loyalty to family and friends that's greater than a loyalty to God. And you know the account, it all started in the garden. It's 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I love my wife, I love my family. But within that, and this, this is not mean or pious, but God has to come first. If God brought us together, God put us together, and God can keep us together, then God has to be first. Uh, who, who brought Eve to Adam? Uh, who gives you the breath? Who gives you rain? Who, who gives you earth? Who gives you the ability to get wealth? Who gives you knowledge? Who gives you we have nothing except that it was given to us from God. I'm not being mean, but 1 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 14, the Bible says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, Eve taken from his side out of the rib after the deep sleep. Adam was not deceived. He knew willingly, willfully, sinning with his eyes wide open, woman being deceived by the subtlety of the serpent. But Adam willingly sinned against God. And I understand the analogy and the, and the love for his wife. I, I, I understand that. But you have to make a basic application today and say... Is there a loyalty to friends and family that's greater than a loyalty to God? And a loyalty to God 
He will not uh, make you uh, hate your family, but there could be division. Christ came that there would be division. If you accept Christ and they don't accept Christ, are you going to allow them to dictate your service for God, your love for God? Notice another one. Same thought, Acts chapter 5. I understand this one's difficult. Acts chapter 5. Doesn't mean that you're mean, better, or anything like that. It means that you have a walk with God that's personal between you and God. And you want so much for your family or your friend to be there with you, walking in agreement. But if not, it still has to be you and God. In Acts chapter 5, you know the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Because of the current purity of the church at that time, God was not going to put up with any lying to the Holy Spirit of God, which is lying to God. And so they sold a possession. And they saw an individual who got notoriety because of it, Barnabas, who was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost, and they thought that they would get in on that. It's not that they didn't give a portion. Praise God for anybody that gives, and you, you ought to, but it was not that they did not give a portion. They did, but there was a, an, an act as if they had give all like Barnabas. But they agreed with one another to hold back a portion. And verse 9 tells us that. Then Peter said unto her, her husband has already been uh, taken up dead, how is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? You've agreed together. A loyalty between husband and wife, friends and family, if you will, that's greater than a loyalty to God. One could have said, hey, let's do this, and the other said, we better not do that. Yeah, you're right. One could say, hey, how about we do this? And the other one says, you better not do that. But when there's an agreement together, you don't have to serve God that much. You don't have to do that much. You don't have to give that much. You don't have to go that much. You don't have to. Oh, you're right. That's when you're getting into deep water. That's having more of a loyalty to friends and family on the outside than a loyalty to God. And the Holy Spirit of God tells you that's not right. The devil has his people, friends and family plan, that are enacted to distract you, to get you off track with God. And the Lord has a friends and family plan called the family of God that are meant to guard you and to guide you in the will of God for your life. Because in the multitude of counselors, there's safety, right counselors. There's persuasion of others. Then there's pressure from friends and friends and family that disrupt you from following God. It's not right. Right friendship, good friendship, Jonathan and David. It's the right example. An iron sharpening iron. Bad friendship, Jonadab and Amnon. You know the story. Loyalty to friends and family that's greater than loyalty to God. God's love first, praying for friends and family. And then last, it's 1 John 2, 16. These are just five, and you could have a, a list of your own, of hindrances that would keep you and I from following God fully, holy, and being the right kind of witness for the cause of Christ and the glory of God. In 1 John chapter 2, it's the lust of the flesh. This is personal within you. This is, is you. Some of it is from the outside, like friends and family telling you things you don't have to go all the time. You don't have to do all that, you know. 
you can skip, you can do this, you can do that. Now, you're saved. I know that. Some of it is when we uh, get into financial situation, even a blessing, and put that over God. Some of it is a lack of faith. I know God can, but will he? But this one is 1 John 2, 16. It's the lust of the flesh. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. This is the lust of the flesh. Those things that are not centered around God. Not centered around seeking ye first the kingdom of God. This is about your fun, about your pleasure and sin for a season and so forth. It takes away from your faithfulness. It hurts your family. It increases fear. It's the lust of the flesh. The old sin nature, the lust of the flesh. Example, King David started with a look. And you and I can say, I, I see it all around me. It's the desires of the flesh. It's the old sin nature. And you and I have to guard ourselves not to be looking around so much, but to be looking up, looking unto the Savior, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, it says, I want it. It's covetousness, which is idolatry. It pleaseth me well. And then the pride of life says within you, I deserve that. Or I don't deserve to be treated like that, but I do deserve to get what I want. And that's not of the Father. It is of the world. It does not please the Father. These are distractions that the devil can use in your life and my life to cause us to go astray. And all we like sheep go astray. And we have a preponderance to go astray. Keep on the straight track. Keep going. Allow God to continue to bless you. There's three main sources of help that God gives us. And they're not new. It's prayer, you talking to God. It's Bible, God talking to you. And it's the local church meeting with God and the children of God on a regular basis and getting armed for what lies ahead. We were of the hindrances. And then we asked him, God, place a hedge of protection about us and about this church to guard us against those hindrances. We want our walk with God to be right. We want our witness for God to be right. We want God to bless and save souls and continue in the work. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the preserved word of God, and dear Lord, for the blessings that it gives to us, the warnings, dear Lord, the protection. Help every one of us, dear Lord, to be cognitive of this and the hindrances that can get into our life. They're instigated by Satan. We know where they come from. But allow the influence in our own lives sometimes. We have to be aware of that. Help us, dear Lord, to be on guard against it. Help us in our walk. Help us in our work and help us in our witness. And this week we're praying for souls to be saved, saints to be strengthened. Please bless the church and your people in Jesus' name. Amen.